Hello and welcome to this episode of Grant Thornton's In Conversation With podcast. I'm Richard Waite, I'm People and Culture Director at the firm and I'm really passionate about early careers and trainee recruitment and it's where I started my career at the firm back in 2010. I'm joined today by Chris and Oishi and we're going to talk about the varied careers that someone can have at a firm like Grant Thornton. But before we get started, let's start with some introductions. Oishi, let me come to you first. Hi, I'm Oishi. I am a manager in the Forensic Investigation Services team and I've been with Grant Thornton for a little over six years now. Great. And Chris? Uh, I'm Chris Rabb. I'm an audit partner uh, in the London office and I've been here since January 2012. Excellent. So knowing what I know about both of your careers, I think we've got some really exciting insights to share with our audience today. But before we get into that, let's start with some easier questions. So have you got three words that best describe your career at Grant Thornton to date and three skills that make you really great at your job? And Oishi, I'll start with you again. Oh, um, I think three words to describe my career. Surprising, rewarding and exciting. Great. And three skills, um, well, I think they'll be curious, skeptical, and friendly. Mm -hmm. Great, Chris. Okay, well, hopefully I don't steal too many of your <laughs> words and, and things, but um, I, the three words I would describe my career uh, here at Grant Thornton have, have been challenging, mm -hmm. enriching, and rewarding. And I would say the three skills uh, that have made me successful are uh, I'm a bit of a problem solver, mm -hmm. uh, I feel I'm a pretty good communicator, mm -hmm. and I feel I can do quite a bit of multitasking, mm -hmm. which is very important in my job. I'll bet, I'll bet. So as a starting point, Chris, it'd be really great to understand a little bit more from yourself about the timeline of your own career. Um, how did your career bring you from Grant Thornton in the U US to Grant Thornton in the UK? Okay, so I started with Grant Thornton in the Phoenix office back in 20, uh, 2006. So once I graduated uh, from university in America, I moved up from being an audit associate to an audit in charge and then an audit manager. Uh, after five years, I spent another year and a half uh, in the States as a audit manager. Mm -hmm. um, an opportunity came up where I could do a two-year secondment in London. Uh, my wife is from England. Uh, I visited here quite a bit, thought it would be kind of nice to do a two-year secondment. Uh, and within a year and a half, I became a full-time uh, UK member uh, and uh, after my son was born and we decided to uh, make it more of a permanent move to the UK. Great. And Oishi, you started your career at Grant Thornton in audit and as you said have moved into an advisory role. Can you talk to me a little bit about your journey at the firm over the last six years? It's very similar to Chris actually. I joined as an audit associate in the public service assurance team in Bristol and um, I spent about three and a half years there where I completed my training contract. And then I think at some point, um, Bristol being a small office, you you know, quite naturally talk to the person sat next to you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my colleagues had moved over to forensics. And that sounded quite interesting. Um, and I think at that point, I made a choice before I completed my training contract to move over into forensics, give that a try and have been here since. Mm. And what was it about forensics that you found particularly attractive um, at that point in your career? In order to sort of looking for something you know, might have gone wrong, might not have gone wrong. But in forensics, it gets a little more interesting where someone comes to you where something might already have gone wrong. Mm. And at that point on, basically retrospectively, proactively kind of dig in and look through and I think that quite appealed to me um, and it was you do get a far larger range of you know breadth and experience the industries the regions you work in so I think that was uh, that was kind of what pulled mm -hmm. me into this. And Chris you've stayed in audit from kind of through your career what is it about audit that has kind of kept you engaged for as long as it has? I think it's the variety um, when I started in 2006, I got to work on a lot of different clients um, from listed clients to small private clients to some government work. Um, so I and also in a lot of different industries. So one of the things, you know, I'm, I'm a curious person. I like to learn about different things, uh, seeing companies that do manufacturing and whatnot. That was 
that was kind of inter interesting. When I came over to the UK, I had the opportunity to work on a few mining clients and that kind of took me around the world a little bit. I got to go down to Africa. I was in China um, and just working on companies here that operate more internationally than some of the clients I had back home in, in the US. Uh, it just kind of always gives me the ability to learn about new companies, work with different people. So it just keeps, keeps it interesting. Mm, I'll bet. And I guess at, at certain points across both of your careers over the last um, number of years, um, internal networks, internal mentors, those key people that we might have internally who've been pivotal in kind of making decisions about what should I do next? Do I go to the UK on comment? Do I move into forensics? Talk to me about how you've tapped into those networks and key people to help you, I guess, navigate those big moments in your career today. Chris. Okay, so I think we have a really good people manager and coaching structure here in the UK. We had a pretty similar one in the US. So I always felt I had someone that I could talk to about how I was doing um, in a job, how, how things were going, what my career development would look like, um, what I was liking about the work, what I wasn't liking about the work. Uh, and that was a way to help develop a bit of a career plan for myself. Um, and as you spend more time, you're going to have your colleagues around you that you can you know, commiserate from time to time. But over time, you, you, you'd learn how they'd help you get through that. And then as you continue to progress, uh, you talk about your career and what you want to do. So I had somebody when the opportunity came up to come to the UK, I said, you know, I'd really like to work in the UK. I'd like to see what it's like working in a different country, working on more international stuff. Um, so I was able to go to my partner. He was able to put me in touch with the right people over here. I came over here and I interviewed, and uh, the person that interviewed me has been here for you know, the 12 years I've been here, and he's the person I'll come to and I'll talk to mm -hmm. about my career development, issues I'm having, but it's not just having a strong manager, as you mentioned, it's people in your, you know, in, in your own cohorts mm -hmm. and the managers and, and the people that you can kind of trust and talk to. And the one thing that I feel over here is we have a good collaborative group. Mm -hmm. And I feel that no one is cutthroat or trying to use things against me. So I felt like I could always be open and honest about mm -hmm. issues I'm having at work or with clients or with, with colleagues. So that's always been helpful. Great. Oishi, what about yourself? I think between your first and your second year, you kind of start to get the idea whether the team you're in, if that's what you want to do long term or not. And I think to an extent, it's down to the individual to speak to people, not immediately within your team, but also to your network. And I think fortunately for me, the team that I was in, I had a lot of role models who had moved to other countries, other service lines. So I knew that when the time came, if I had asked like, you know what, this is really good and I'm happy with this, mm -hmm. but I want to do a bit more. Yeah. I knew that would be supported. Um, so I think after my second year and having those conversations with my colleagues and forensics, I sort of knew, yes, this is where I want to go and this is what I want to do. Um, and I remember this one conversation I had when my transfer was already agreed between audit and forensics and one of the audit partners um, came down to me and he said, you know, it's not a problem that you want to move on from audit. Um, I think the key thing is that you want to remain in the firm and that's our objective as well. And um, yes, I don't think since then I've looked back and I think I also moved between Bristol to London. Um, a part of it was a bit selfish because a lot of my friends um, after uni had uh, gone their first jobs in London, which I didn't. But once I transferred to Forensics, that again was supported that yes, if you want to move um, from the Southwest to London, and I had the support from my people manager to do that. And I think in terms of the opportunities and sort of my oversight of what was going on in the forensic space. The visibility was slightly better, so it was definitely a good decision and was supported, like you said, by everybody that I spoke to. And Chris, since coming to the UK, you've had some really exciting opportunities to continue to develop your career, connecting in with colleagues and peers from the broader network of international member firms. Can you tell us a bit more about that? 
Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of things that I've been able to do. Uh, one is the GTAR program, mm -hmm. uh, which is an annual review of audit firms in the member in the member firm network. Mm -hmm. So every three years, every member firm gets a number of their audit files reviewed, mm -hmm. and and that kind of came up because one of the colleagues that I knew from an engagement back in the US that I was working on, she joined GTI. Mm -hmm. And when I was in one office that was going through the GTAR, I saw her and she came up and we started talking and we connected and she says, if you wanna do it, mm -hmm. just let me know. So that's one thing that I get to do um, on an annual basis if it works out uh, from a timing basis. But what I get to do is I get to meet partners uh, from our other member firms. Uh, not just the ones that I'm reviewing, but the people that join to do the reviews. So it helps to build up that network uh, on an international basis. Uh, the other thing that I was able to do is I was invited to join uh, the ALP, which is the Advanced Leadership Program. Um, and this is done with people who are kind of senior managers, directors, new partners. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is around the global firm. Uh, so my cohort had about 50, 60 people on it uh, from all different member mm -hmm. firms. And we spent time doing some remote training, uh, but then we were also in Berlin and Mexico City. So I got to do a little traveling, mm -hmm. see the world a bit, uh, and really develop some relationships. Uh, and what's helpful is when we go out to market, mm -hmm. uh, I do know people in certain places as a result of all these uh, different programs I've been involved with because then I can always reach out to them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they reach out to me and even if I'm not the one that's going to work with them, mm -hmm. I can put them in touch with different people. So it's been really interesting to get these opportunities and these opportunities are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, some are brought to you mm -hmm. and some you have to look for. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, as long as you're willing to try something new, uh, those, those opportunities will be available to you. Mm -hmm. I think what's come in through really clearly in both of your sponsors is the importance of networks and connections in your own team, across the UK member firm, and more broadly across the global network. I guess for someone starting out right at the beginning of their career, they're a new associate. We know the world's changed over the last few years in terms of the way that we're all working, but what would your top tips be for individuals joining the firm now in terms of building their network from scratch in a firm like ours, or she? I think my advice would be first try to know your team and the work that you do really really well and once you feel comfortable with that you have a strong internal network mm -hmm. use that leverage that to build your network and talk about mm -hmm. talk to people about the work that you do mm -hmm. um, within your own teams um, yeah Chris any top tips for those joining I I would say take your time so similar to Oishi it's you don't develop your, your network in a day. You don't, you don't develop it in one year. It takes some time. And I, I would say be open. Mm -hmm. uh, be willing to talk to people. Um, or she used the word curious uh, before. And I, I think curiosity is a great thing that when you're asking somebody questions about what they like, what they do, mm -hmm. you, can, you can have a network of people where, okay, I know you because we started an audit together mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've been in the trenches together, we've done hard work on this OA job mm -hmm. together, but oh, I know so-and-so because actually we both like the same sport or we mm -hmm. like the same movie or music and we mm -hmm. went to concerts together. Mm -hmm. And you can just build it over time. And I think if you're just willing to talk to people mm -hmm. uh, and to put yourself out there, um, that will help. And the other thing is not to be intimidated by more senior mm -hmm. people. And I know it's an easy thing to say because you know, I say it to people, oh, don't, oh, come up, invite me to coffee, I'll go out mm -hmm. and I'll talk to you. And I remember when I was 21, 22, mm -hmm. when I, the partner asked to talk to me, I was sitting there thinking, oh, great, this is it. I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting my pink slip. That's, the, that's it. That's me done. But, you know, I, I think if you're willing to, you know, put yourself out there, you'll find, as I've said before, I feel we have a collaborative team. Mm -hmm. I think people will work with you. They'll talk to you. Uh, and we all... We all sometimes just need a laugh mm -hmm. or just something mm -hmm. to talk about, a little distraction uh, to get through the day. And I think that'll help build your network internally. And from there, you'll get those skills that mm -hmm. building an external network will just start to become second nature. Mm -hmm. Oishi, 
Uh, just building on what Chris said, as you progress between grades, there is an expectation that you're going to speak to people externally mm -hmm. and start to build those external mm -hmm. networks and eventually, not immediately, um, once you get to a certain point in your career, that brings in the work. Mm -hmm. So it is a transferable skill. Um, you keep building on it. Um, and I just following on from Chris's point, I think it's really important to go speak to people because unless you speak to them, they don't know that you're interested in what they're doing and they will remember you when the time comes or an opportunity comes and they will call you in to come help them. So. Yeah, and it's a good point that you bring up is that network is going to hopefully be the pipeline for future work. Um, but what you have to realize is it's very unlikely you're going to meet somebody at a networking event or you're going to meet somebody on the first time and they're just going to hand you a bit of work. It takes time to build up. I guess if you're just willing to, as you say, willing to talk to somebody, willing to say hi, you don't have to go into you know, a spiel. You don't have to try to sell somebody something. It's all just about talking and, and getting comfortable with uh, a normal conversation. I think what's coming through in our conversation so far as a common thread is around variety and an experience which I think have been important to both of your careers to date. What opportunities are there for people who might be watching this podcast now who might be just starting their career or just thinking about starting their career? Kind of what opportunities exist in their future? Maybe once they've qualified to maybe spread their wings globally across the international network. Uh, well, we have uh, a GEMS program, so Global Mobility, and they have a listing of all the potential international secondments. Mm -hmm. And normally, you wouldn't get to go on an international secondment until you're fully qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's not until you're a manager. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is to look into that. There's um, in sites on the internet that will kind of go through all the listings. It's worthwhile talking to people who have been on those. And again, on the internet, you can find uh, people's stories of who's been on to comment. Um, and there's usually people uh, where reaching out and saying this is available. But you could also talk to your people manager and you could say, you know, I'd really be interested in going to the, the United States or I want to spend a, a year down in Australia. Mm -hmm. You do have to search it out a little bit, mm -hmm. but it also isn't too difficult if you just ask the, the question to your people manager. And we've talked to you both about how you've both built amazing careers at the firm, and I'm sure it's not been plain sailing the whole time. Can you talk to me about any challenges that have come up for either of you and what you've done to kind of navigate those? Oishi. Um, I think there have been two, and um, moving between year one and year two, and um, I think post one of my performance review, I had some constructive criticism on, you know, we expect you to be here, but you're here, and yeah. we expect you to get up to here. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, um, a lot of my peers were getting some opportunities to move on to the next stage yeah. earlier on. Um, and I think I had a particularly challenging conversation with my people manager at the time to say, why don't you give me a chance and give me an opportunity and let's see how I do mm -hmm. after you know, the first client or the first project. Um, and there was somebody else in my team who had also spoken to about this. And uh, she very kindly gave me that opportunity to, you know, carry out that project or be an in charge on one of her projects. Um, and it worked quite well. And I was able to establish at that point, you know, well, I understand these are the lessons and these are the learnings and this is what I'm going to take forward. Um, which is why I say it's really key in your first year that you really understand what is expected of you at the end of your first and your second year. Because sometimes when you don't have those proactive conversations, you don't quite gauge where you're supposed to be. And I think my second one was when I'd failed my penultimate exam before my, um, my last um, case study before I qualified. I was very upset. I think up until that point, I never failed an exam and I took it quite hard as well. And one of my um, senior colleagues within the team had learned through my people manager that um, I was quite upset about missing my, um, or failing one of my exams, which meant I wasn't able to qualify until six months later and all my peers had yeah. passed and were gonna move on. Um, and he gave me a call one day and said like, look, Oishi, I understand this was, um, this is quite hard and it's going to be hard to see your peers moving on. And I believe that, you know, you'll be fine when you reset this exam. 
And I think it was just that gesture. It was mm -hmm. very compassionate, very empathetic, and it meant a lot to me, somebody who was struggling from having to deal with a sort of setback. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think those were two sort of challenging moments for me, but I'm glad I had those experiences mm -hmm. now in hindsight. Yeah. And Chris? Well, I mean, I don't think I've ever had an audit go perfectly. So, uh, you know, there's always, always a lot to learn from there. But one, I, I, I guess one of the things that kind of threw me off of my, my career path or, or where I wanted to get to was after I de decided that I was going to be here uh, in the UK and it was going to be more permanent, um, I found out that I needed to qualify again as a chartered accountant. Uh, and that meant that I had to go on a training contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that started in 2015 mm -hmm. and I had to take tests again. So having been through all my university, all the tests that I had to take and not having had taken a test since 2008, I had to start mm -hmm. taking tests again in 2016. And it was kind of weird to be in, in my thirties with a, you know, 23, 24 year olds who were, uh, you know, taking the tests uh, and, and qualifying. But it, it was one of those things that it did kind of maybe hold me back a year or so in, in my career development. Um, but I did have to, to go through it. It is something that, uh, you know, I learned from. Uh, mm -hmm. I definitely did not like taking case. It was, it is one of the worst exams I think I've ever taken in my life. Um, but once I got through that, it just was something that I know, hey, there's not much I can't overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, in the grand scheme of things, you know, in a 40 year career, what's an extra 12 months mm -hmm. to you know, get through something? And now it's good. I, I, I have a, a dual uh, qualification mm -hmm. and I can sign audit opinions pretty much anywhere in the world now. And, and that's not a lot of a lot of people can say that. Yep. So, yeah, great stuff. Oishi, you referenced um, the constructive feedback that you had early on in your career, and I think that's something that we all have to get used to, right? Working in a professional environment, that feedback and regular feedback is just part of what we do. We give it, we receive it, we take it on positively and proactively. I guess for both of you, have there been any key pieces of feedback that you've received along your career journey that have kind of made a huge difference or kind of really helped you take that step forwards? Yeah, I think to sum it up, someone said to me, don't dwell on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was a trainee and even now there were some things I would reread and reread and think oh there must be something wrong with this or there must be mm -hmm. something going on but, which I haven't quite spotted and someone said to me once you know what it's fine we've done a bit you know now move it along don't dwell on it and I think it was to do with a piece of work mm -hmm. but even like if you take a step back and think, oh, you know, I had this constructive piece of criticism and, you know, you don't take that personally. You take the lessons out of it. Mm -hmm. Don't dwell on it. Work upon it. Move along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris. Well, I've gotten I've gotten a lot of good feedback over my career. Um, and one of the areas that I I had to work on a lot is, you know, trying to cut the emotion out of work sometimes because it's easy to kind of get worked up. It's easy to read an email uh, from a client or from a colleague and take it in a way and, and take it personally. And uh, a lot of what I was told is, you know, take a, take a deep breath, walk away from it. Mm -hmm. um, so take the time, reread what you've written, run it past somebody else, because sometimes you might think this is fine, and somebody else might say that's a bit, mm -hmm. yeah, that that that's a bit aggressive, and, mm -hmm. and you sit there and say, okay, yeah, no, now I, I can see how somebody could take that a mm -hmm. different way. So you know, the the key is is always to try to resolve an issue, mm -hmm. uh, not to throw gasoline on the fire. It's mm -hmm. to extinguish it. It's to to get it sorted out. So it's always worthwhile to take that deep breath and make sure that you're not uh, making things worse. Uh, so that's kind of some advice I'd give. Great. Oishi, um, thinking about our new cohort of trainees who are about to join or maybe future cohorts of trainees who will join, as someone who's had a successful career at the firm to date, what would your advice be for those individuals who are joining in that first three, six, nine months? What would they should be focusing, what should they be focusing on? Strengthen the network with your peers that you're coming in with. 
And those are friendships that you're going to build for a lifetime or for as long as you are here. Um, I think I also talked about, you know, learning your work well, understand what is expected of you at the end of the first year and the second year. So have those proactive check-ins with your people, manager or whoever, understand from them, set those expectations at the start of your work at the start of the job and uh, you just need to be honest to yourself and honest to the people that you're working with that you know this is where I'm at mm -hmm. and this is where I want to get to what do I do to bridge that gap. Chris what about the associates joining your team what do the really great ones do in those early days to really um, set themselves up for success? I would say talk to your colleagues, mm -hmm. ask questions, absorb the information. Mm. Great. Thank you both for joining me on today's podcast. I'm sure your career journeys and your career stories have inspired the next cohort of Grant Thornton talent. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining this episode of In Conversation With, um, the Grant Thornton podcast. We look forward to you joining a future episode very soon.